I'm here to talk to you about something that really blends in with the last talk. Um, we're trying to replace an MRI machine and put it into a wearable about this size. So you can wear it around your body, find tumors, and put it across your brain and be able to communicate with thought alone. So that sounds impossible, right? So let me walk you through why I think it's possible and what we've done so far towards that. The first question is, why now? What I said sounds pretty difficult, but I believe it's the time to do this now because the tools of our time, big data, machine learning, and the often overlooked trillion-dollar manufacturing supply chain in Asia, where I've lived and breathed, shipping product on the hairy edge of optical physics now for about 25 years. So I've, as I've mentioned, I've shipped a lot of consumer electronics basically distinguished by the screen and the camera chips in the lowly fabs of Asia, where now we have a trickle-down of Moore's Law, enabling a discontinuity. And it'll sound pretty benign when I tell you about it, but the implications are pretty profound. And that's that the pixel size of displays and camera chips is now at the wavelength of light. And that means we can record the waves in the wavelength of light, and the implications of that for seeing inside of our body are pretty profound. So let me walk you through a bit of this. So that's the goal. Replace that big MRI machine with a wearable of a ski hat or um, a bandage or a bra so that we can see inside of our bodies at high resolution for three orders of magnitude lower cost. We envision at scale the cost of our device costing about what a smartphone does. And this cost of a scan being about the cost of a phone call rather than $1,000 for an MRI scan or $16,000 for an fMRI scan, which is the going cost in California these days. And so it really is classic innovator's dilemma of looking at these manufacturing process improvements that I helped put in place in my last job where I was running advanced virtual reality and augmented reality at Oculus and Facebook, and I and my colleagues at Apple and Google and Microsoft and Magic Leap and Sony and so forth were able to get a lot of manufacturing process improvements in place to lead to next generation high fidelity, virtual reality and augmented reality, and 3D sensing so you don't have to type a password into your smartphone to unlock it. And I saw this thing happening and I thought, wow, every brain cell in the world is working on virtual reality and augmented reality. And I liked to shoot up video games when I was 15 too, but you know, I was kind of for, way more interested. So I quit my job, not being quite sure how to do it, got a lab and figured out how to do it. And I just hope you all do the same. If you see something, just quit your job and go for it because we need more change. So how does this work? Um, our bodies are translucent to two-ton magnetic fields, to gamma rays, to x-rays, and to lowly red light. Can we bring the lights down a little bit? I just want to show this is a laser, and uh, you know it's a laser, but it spreads out when it goes through my hand. Lowly red light goes right through my hand. And guess which is cheaper, gamma rays, two-ton magnets, x-rays, or a little laser pointer? It's pretty obvious, and so the question is really, you'll notice that's a dot there. When it goes through my hand, it scatters everywhere. That's really what's prevented us using red and near-infrared light to see inside of our bodies. And the way we can descatter the light is something I spent the first decade of my career on. We use holography. Holography records both the intensity of light and that phase of light, the waves and the wavelength of light, with pixel sizes recording that hologram. This is in film. We also can record it on camera chips that are approximately the wavelength of light. So since we've had that trickle down of Moore's law, we now have this in the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure in terms of processes. The challenge is to make a chip. So the second key is descattering the light. And then the third key is using ultrasonic pings, focused ultrasound, which can also enable us to do surgery, open the blood-brain barrier, and so forth. But focusing an ultrasonic ping down into the brain, and then we let the light in. And we let the light in later for 
a, a pretty simple reason when I tell you. Um, sound travels slower than light, and we want them to end up at the same place in the same time. And so we bring in the, the, the light later, and the light that goes through that ultrasonic focus changes color ever so slightly, just like the pitch of a police car siren changes as it speeds past you. Doppler shift. And so we use that change in wavelength um, to exploit another property of holography, which is that only two beams of exactly the same color light can make a hologram. And so we, we wavelength shift another beam, bring it in in a light guide plate, which is standard when you make displays. Like, I'm, we're looking at, um, in your cell phone, you have light that comes straight out, but it comes in from the side. It's called a light guide plate. And so we do this interference. We create a hologram. That's what that fringe structure looks like. That's the wavelengths of light interfering microscopically. And then we decode that, much like Rosalind Franklin decoded this iconic image of X-ray diffraction to reveal the structure of DNA for the first time. It took her a long time to do that back in the day. We can do that a million times a second with the camera chips we've designed, which are now standard double stack processes where you take two chips, put them on top of each other. The first chip records the intensity of the light, and the second chip can decode it in real time with a logic layer. So then we, we then scan another ultrasonic ping. And doing this, we can scan out the whole brain voxel by voxel, that's a 3D pixel. We don't have to do it line by line or sheet by sheet. We can look at any kind of resolution we want because we can change with our ultrasonic chips the frequency and then the focus size of it. So we can look in fine detail in areas of interest and so forth. So you're probably thinking, well, that sounds great, but what about skull and bones? Red light goes th straight through skull and bones. This is a real human skull that we, we a, friend, uh, uh, a colleague of mine, bought at skullsunlimited.com. No joke. <laughs> and the red light goes right through it. So no problem. The sound goes through it, changes speed a little bit, and you have to compensate for that, but, but we do that as well. So one thing that we can see really clearly is blood right now. And um, red light, and near-infrared light, is absorbed by blood. And that's super important, because any tumor bigger than a millimeter or two goes through a process called angiogenesis, which means it steals blood from your body and grows veins and arteries. So the tumor can get a good blood supply so it can grow fast and try to kill you. So tumors have five times the amount of blood as normal tissue. We can see it, you can see it here, our cameras can see it. And it's also interesting, so that gets cancer, right? Number one killer. Let's look at cardiovascular disease. We can see where blood isn't, where there's clogs in your heart or arteries. And we can even imagine seeing how your diet changes that, so you can see the impact of that, positive or negative. So, Circa this summer, these were the kinds of images that we were able to get with phantom tissue, optically mimicking and ultrasonically mimicking tissue, where we could image vasculature and tumors at about 0.5 millimeter resolution, which is about 10 times the resolution of fMRI, um, a little bit higher than standard, standard MRI. And uh, we could only do dead things, so we'd bought, buy whatever was on sale in the meat market, and the team kind of revolted because the lab started to smell a lot when the chicken was in there for a while. So, um, but, but I'm going to show you how we're doing live things now. But one thing I want to mention is um, blood changes color, whether it's carrying oxygen or not. And so we can see that by using two, two beams of light, slightly different colors of, of red, one optimized at 720-ish, and another at you know, 820, 840. The absorption of water isn't seen here, but this is called the infrared window of your body, where if we could see in the infrared, we'd all look, if we weren't wearing clothes, like jellyfish with blood. <laughs> That's actually how translucent you are, kind of scattering. Um, we can see the color change whether blood is carrying oxygen or not. That's exactly what a $16,000 fMRI image does. It records basically where your body is using oxygen, looking at the depletion of oxygen from the blood. 
for example, in your brain where you're using oxygen, that's the active part. Where you're not using oxygen, that's not active part. And there's a lot that we can do with that. So we do that using two wavelengths of a laser. fMRI does that using a two-ton magnet, liquid helium, um, a power plant, and a magnetic shielding being the most expensive rooms in hospitals. So there's some improvement. We can also, it takes about four seconds to see this, this change from oxygenated blood to deoxygenated blood, but there's a dip in the beginning, which we think we can see, sub-second response. And more, for the first year or so of the company, I just looked with the team at the limits of what we could do with the physics of this approach, to see how deep we could see into optically mimicking flesh and skull and bone. And the answer was, whew, can we, can we get to the resolution of fMRI, 10 cubic millimeters? Yep, check. Can we get to MRI, about a millimeter, cubic millimeter? Check. We kept going. It turns out we could focus down to a few microns of resolution, which that sounds like a 1,000 times better, but that's in X, Y, and Z. So that's a 1,000 times a 1,000 times a 1,000, or a billion times higher resolution, potentially, using this technology of descattering the, the wavefronts. So that's super cool. This was our lab prototype circa last spring. We've really slimmed it down. We did it this way. I mentioned I'm a chip designer. Any chip designer worse, th worse their salt has gotten thrown out of a fab or two in their career for not shipping enough volume. And so what you do is you wait till you have the design perfected. Then, and you do a jerry-riggering uh, existing components while you architect your chip, then you send your chip, you, you design your chip, send it for manufacture, and then you, you can ship much more fast. So these are the three um, components that we've designed, new camera chips that are really optimized for the near-infrared with very high efficiency conversion of infrared light to electrons and then rapid um, decoding of those holographic images via a discrete Fourier transform. The ultrasonic chips, which are also now standard and manufactured in MEMS, MEMS um, fabs, microelectromechanical systems. And those, we, um, we can focus and steer the beam that's focused plus or minus 60 degrees to scan out our body. And then special lasers. I mentioned we did dead things first. That's because to do alive things, we have to deal with the fact that, well, we're alive. It's good to be alive, but to be alive means we move, we breathe, and more importantly, blood moves through our veins. And so we can stop the blood via a tourniquet, as a friend of mine who's a professor, actually in the Netherlands, um, for you orange jacketed ones. Um, but that doesn't really work around your neck. That's called strangulation. So we solved the problem with a, with a pulsed laser that we've created. We've actually created a few different types of them, where it's almost like a strobe or a flash on a camera. So you freeze the action in a microsecond and can record very well with that. So that's what we do there. This is the system that we've got right now in our, in our small animal facility in a secret undisclosed location in the, in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we've really shrunk the, the size of it down to this. We also um, lowered the amount of light we needed by 10. This is the recent improvements in the last six months, um, up the signal to noise ratio or image quality, smaller footprint, and upped it by 100x. So lots of exponential stuff. We keep going. So fMRI has some pretty profound implications. I'm going to go through this super quickly because there's been some really good intros. Um, this work by Professor Jack Gallant, UC Berkeley, through uh, students in MRI machines for hundreds of hours, recording them responding to um, hundreds of hours of YouTube videos. Then showed a new presented clip, and using the scan data alone and deep learning, was able to infer what the students were looking at. I saw this about seven years ago, and I thought, whoa. We just have to up the resolution and put it into a wearable to get a lot more data so we can communicate you know, telepathically. Japanese group did it with dreams, uh, woke up the graduate students as they fell asleep and asked what they were dreaming about to create the data store. Uh, and you're probably wondering, what's the accuracy? We're not studying all 100 billion neurons here, each with 100,000 dif different connections. That's ca called causal. Instead, we're going top down. But there's, for example, a word cloud of thinking of numbers has less than 5% uh, false positive. 
this is back to UC Berkeley work. Um, there's even a sex and violence center uh, or map where you're thinking of, of these kinds of things. So you can imagine turning them off if you went to work and maybe didn't want to mention any thoughts you might have of sex and violence. Um, and another thing, it's pretty accurate. For example, if I threw any of you in an fMRI machine and showed you a thousand images twice, I could then guess what image you were looking at or imagining, because the same areas light up whether you look at an image or imagine the image, with 80% accuracy. And through random guess with a thousand images, that would be about 0.1%. So it's getting pretty good even with the existing resolution of MRI machines and the discomfort of lying in them for hundreds of hours. So the bet we're making is with massively more data and a wearable at higher resolution with increased temporal response, plus the non-invasive ability to focus down to neurons, we can develop better hierarchical algorithms and move this forward. And then there's the two-thirds of humanity that lacks access to medical imaging. And that's actually all of medical, all of us. For example, we know MR imaging is better than mammography for breast cancer detection, 10 times better. But do we use it for routine screening in the US? No. Does any country in the world use it for routine screening? No. The reason why? It's too expensive. So we can have better, that's how we diagnose cancers now, is by seeing inside of our body. If we can bring that down to the cost of a smartphone. People might say, what about false positives? That's living in a world where it's $1,000 or $8,000 for an MRI scan. It's what it costs me in, in San Francisco. What if you could just scan it every day, every week? Then you'd care about three questions. Is it getting bigger? Is it getting smaller? Is it staying the same size? If it's getting bigger, you might want to act. Otherwise, you can just watch it. Also, uh, there's this biological basis of, of, of depression and, and all kinds of uh, mental disease, where if you could do an fMRI scan, you could see in precision psychology what the condition was and how the therapy was helping in a non-subjective way outside of DSM and questions. We could close the loop and see what could have the best impact. And then there's focused ultrasound. As I showed, we're, we're using chips to focus the ultrasound for about a microsecond while we pulse the light in. If we focus that same amount, that same intensity of ultrasound for 15 seconds, we can ablate tissue, we can open the blood-brain barrier, we can deliver microdosing of drugs at full intensity at the right spot by bursting drugs that are encapsulated so they only act there huge um, implications of all of these kinds of areas using focused ultrasound. FDA, pretty straightforward. I've been talking to them. You know, it's light, well-established safety, and ultrasound, well-established safety conditions. So we don't anticipate much trouble with the FDA. So I think from where I sit, this is inevitable. I'm thrilled to talk to you all about it. I hope you join us and be part of it to shape it. We're doing a workshop on this this afternoon, so talk more then. And I've got 26 seconds left. No, I'm over time, so thanks. <laughs> going up. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. One second. Oh. First of all, wow. Thank you for sharing. This is obviously disruptive. What is your response from the traditional big imaging companies? And what messaging might you have for the folks who want to take this disruption really into the clinic? Uh, so those two uh, what the response, they're actually thrilled. Uh, it's not a hard sell to get rid of a, a two-ton magnet that requires liquid helium to go into it and, and so forth. And the other thing about the people selling those devices, devices, rooms, is that um, they don't get to keep the data because they made the deals like 30 years ago. And so they're actually interested in, in moving forward too because right. there's not been a lot of innovation. And how to get this in clinics? That's a good question. Love to talk about it. But the imaging suites for the big hospitals in the big cities, they already have them. So we're actually interested in talking to um, places, rural places, or places that don't have imaging suites. Can we get this in ambulances, in doctor's offices, in rural hospitals, in urgent care, is a question we're asking right now. And how fast can we do that? Thanks, Mary. So, thank Thanks you. Really. Watch the space.